Section 3 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 3 The Pomegranate Seeds, Part 1. Mother Ceres was exceedingly fond of her daughter Proserpina, and seldom let her go alone into the fields. But, just at the time when my story begins, the good lady was very busy, because she had the care of the wheat, and the Indian corn, and the rye, and barley, and, in short, of the crops of every kind all over the earth. And as the season had thus far been uncommonly backward, it was necessary to make the harvest ripen more speedily than usual. So she put on her turban, made of poppies, a kind of flower which she was always noted for wearing, and got into her car drawn by a pair of winged dragons, and was just ready to set off. "'Dear mother,' said Proserpina, "'I shall be very lonely while you are away. May I not run down to the shore and ask some of the sea nymph to come up out of the waves and play with me?' "'Yes, child,' answered Mother Ceres. The sea nymphs are good creatures and will never lead you into any harm, but you must take care not to stray away from them, nor go wandering about the fields by yourself. Young girls without their mothers to take care of them are very apt to get into mischief. The child promised to be as prudent as if she were a grown-up woman, and by the time the winged dragons had whirled the car out of sight, she was already on the shore calling to the sea nymphs to come and play with her. They knew Proserpina's voice, and were not long in showing their glistening faces and sea-green hair above the water, at the bottom of which was their home. They brought along with them a great many beautiful shells, and sitting down on the moist sand, where the surf wave broke over them, they busied themselves in making a necklace which they hung around Proserpina's neck. By way of showing her gratitude, the child besought them to go with her a little way into the fields, so that they might gather abundance of flowers, with which she would make each of her kind playmates a wreath. "'Oh, no, dear Proserpina,' cried the sea-nymphs, "'we dare not go with you upon the dry land. We are apt to grow faint, unless at every breath we can snuff up the salt breeze of the ocean. And don't you see how careful we are to let the surf wave break over us every moment or two, so as to keep ourselves comfortably moist?' If it were not for that, we should soon look like bunches of uprooted seaweed dried in the sun. It is a great pity, said Proserpina, but do you wait for me here, and I will run and gather my apron full of flowers, and be back again before the surf wave has broken ten times over you. I long to make you some wreaths that shall be as lovely as this necklace of many-coloured shells. We will wait, then, answered the sea-nymphs, but while you are gone, we may as well lie down on a bank of soft sponge under the water. The air to-day is a little too dry for our comfort, but we will pop up our heads every few minutes to see if you are coming. The young Proserpina ran quickly to a spot where, only the day before, she had seen a great many flowers. These, however, were now a little past their bloom, and wishing to give her friends the freshest and loveliest blossoms, she strayed farther into the fields, and found some that made her scream with delight. Never had she met with such exquisite flowers before, violets so large and fragrant, roses with so rich and delicate a blush, such superb hyacinths, and such aromatic pinks, and many others, some of which seemed to be of new shapes and colours. Two or three times, moreover, she could not help thinking that a tuft of most splendid flowers had suddenly sprouted out of the earth before her very eyes, as if on purpose to tempt her a few steps farther. Proserpina's apron was soon filled and brimming over with delightful blossoms. She was on the point of turning back in order to rejoin the sea-nymphs and sit with them on the moist sands, all twining wreaths together. But, a little farther on, what should she behold? It was a large shrub, completely covered with the most magnificent flowers in the world. "'The darlings!' cried Proserpina. And then she thought to herself, I was looking at that spot only a moment ago. How strange it is that I did not see the flowers. The nearer she approached the shrub, 
the more attractive it looked, until she came quite close to it, and then, although its beauty was richer than words can tell, she hardly knew whether to like it or not. It bore above a hundred flowers of the most brilliant hues, and each different from the others, but all having a kind of resemblance among themselves, which showed them to be sister blossoms. But there was a deep, glossy luster on the leaves of the shrub, and on the petals of the flowers, that made Proserpina doubt whether they might not be poisonous. To tell you the truth, foolish as it may seem, she was half inclined to turn round and run away. "'What a silly child I am,' thought she, taking courage. "'It is really the most beautiful shrub that ever sprang out of the earth. "'I will pull it up by the roots and carry it home, "'and plant it in my mother's garden.' "'Holding her apron full of flowers with her left hand, "'Presipina seized the large shrub with the other, "'and pulled and pulled, "'but it was hardly able to loosen the soil about its roots. "'What a deep-rooted plant it was!' Again the girl pulled with all her might, and observed that the earth began to stir and crack to some distance around the stem. She gave another pull, but relaxed her hold, fancying that there was a rumbling sound right beneath her feet. Did the roots extend down into some enchanted cavern? Then, laughing at herself for so childish a notion, she made another effort. Up came the shrub, and Proserpina staggered back, holding the stem triumphantly in her hand, and gazing at the deep hole which its roots had left in the soil. Much to her astonishment, this hole kept spreading wider and wider, and growing deeper and deeper, until it really seemed to have no bottom, and all the while there came a rumbling noise out of its depths, louder and louder, and nearer and nearer, and sounding like the tramp of horses' hoofs, and the rattling of wheels. Too much frightened to run away, she stood straining her eyes into this wonderful cavity, and soon saw a team of four sable horses snorting smoke out of their nostrils and tearing their way out of the earth, with a splendid golden chariot whirling at their heels. They leaped out of the bottomless hole, chariot and all, and there they were, tossing their black manes, flourishing their black tails, and curveting with every one of their hoofs off the ground at once, close by the spot where Proserpina stood. In the chariot sat the figure of a man, richly dressed, with a crown on his head, all flaming with diamonds. He was of a noble aspect, and rather handsome, but looked sullen and discontented, and he kept rubbing his eyes and shading them with his hand, as if he did not live enough in the sunshine to be very fond of its light. As soon as this personage saw the affrighted Proserpina, he beckoned her to come a little nearer. "'Do not be afraid,' said he, with as cheerful a smile as he knew how to put on. "'Come, will you not like to ride a little way with me in my beautiful chariot?' But Proserpina was so alarmed that she wished for nothing but to get out of his reach, and no wonder. The stranger did not look remarkably good-natured, in spite of his smile, and as for his voice, its tones were deep and stern, and sounded as much like the rumbling of an earthquake underground as anything else. As is always the case with children in trouble, Proserpina's first thought was to call for her mother. "'Mother! Mother Ceres!' cried she, all in a tremble. "'Come quickly and save me!' But her voice was too faint for her mother to hear. Indeed, it is most probable that Ceres was then a thousand miles off, making the corn grow in some far distant country. Nor could it have availed her poor daughter even had she been within hearing, for no sooner did Proserpina begin to cry out than the stranger leaped to the ground, caught the child in his arms, and again mounting the chariot, shook the reins and shouted to the four horses to set off. They immediately broke into so swift a gallop that it seemed rather like flying through the air than running along the earth. In a moment Proserpina lost sight of the pleasant vale of Enna in which she had always dwelt. Another instant, and even the summit of Mount Etna had become so blue in the distance that she could scarcely distinguish it from the smoke that gushed out of its crater. But still the poor child screamed and scattered her full apron of flowers along the way, and left a long cry trailing behind the chariot. And many mothers, to whose ears it came, ran quickly to see if any mischief had befallen their children. 
but Mother Ceres was a great way off and could not hear the cry. As they rode on, the stranger did his best to soothe her. "'Why should you be so frightened, my pretty child?' said he, trying to soften his rough voice. "'I promise not to do you any harm. "'What, you have been gathering flowers? "'Wait till we come to my palace, and I will give you a garden full of prettier flowers than those, "'all made of pearls and diamonds and rubies. "'Can you guess who I am? "'They call my name Pluto, and I am the king of diamonds and all other precious stones.' Every atom of the gold and silver that lies under the earth belongs to me, to say nothing of the copper and iron, and of the coal mines which supply me with abundance of fuel. Do you see this splendid crown upon my head? You may have it for a plaything. Oh, we shall be very good friends, and you will find me more agreeable than you expect, when once we get out of this troublesome sunshine. Let me go home, cried Proserpina. Let me go home. "'My home is better than your mother's,' answered King Pluto. "'It is a palace, all made of gold, with crystal windows, "'and because there is little or no sunshine thereabouts, "'the apartments are illuminated with diamond lamps. "'You never saw anything half so magnificent as my throne. "'If you like, you may sit down on it, "'and be my little queen, and I will sit on the footstool.' "'I don't care for golden palaces and thrones,' sobbed Proserpina, Oh, my mother, my mother, carry me back to my mother. But King Pluto, as he called himself, only shouted to his steeds to go faster. Pray do not be foolish, Proserpina, said he, in rather a sullen tone. I offer you my palace and my crown, and all the riches that are under the earth, and you treat me as if I were doing you an injury. The one thing which my palace needs is a merry little maid to run upstairs and down, and cheer up the rooms with her smile, and this is what you must do for King Pluto. Never, answered Proserpina, looking as miserable as she could, I shall never smile again till you set me down at my mother's door. But she might just as well have talked to the wind that whistled past them, for Pluto urged on his horses and went faster than ever. Proserpina continued to cry out, and screamed so long and so loudly that her poor little voice was almost screamed away, and when it was nothing but a whisper, she happened to cast her eyes over a great broad field of waving grain, and whom do you think she saw? Whom but Mother Ceres making the corn grow, and too busy to notice the golden chariot as it went rattling along. The child mustered all her strength, and gave one more scream, but was out of sight before Ceres had time to turn her head. King Pluto had taken a road which now began to grow excessively gloomy. It was bordered on each side by rocks and precipices, between which the rumbling of the chariot wheels was reverberated with a noise like rolling thunder. The trees and bushes that grew in the crevices of the rocks had very dismal foliage, and by and by, although it was hardly noon, the air became obscured with a grey twilight. The black horses had rushed along so swiftly that they were already beyond the limits of the sunshine, but the duskier it grew, the more did Pluto's visage assume an air of satisfaction. After all, he was not an ill-looking person, especially when he left off twisting his features into a smile that did not belong to them. Proserpina peeped at his face through the gathering dusk, and hoped that he might not be so very wicked as she at first thought him. "'Ah, this twilight is truly refreshing,' said King Pluto, "'after being so tormented with that ugly and impertinent glare of the sun. "'How much more agreeable is lamplight or torchlight, "'more particularly when reflected from diamonds? "'It will be a magnificent sight when we get to my palace.' "'Is it much farther?' asked Proserpina. "'And will you carry me back when I have seen it?' "'We will talk of that by and by,' answered Pluto. "'We are just entering my dominions.' Do you see that tall gateway before us? When we pass those gates, we are at home, and there lies my faithful mastiff at the threshold. Cerberus, Cerberus, come hither, my good dog. So saying, Pluto pulled at the reins and stopped the chariot right between the tall, massive pillars of the gateway. The mastiff, of which he had spoken, got up from the threshold and stood on his hinder legs, so as to put his forepaws on the chariot wheel. "'But my stars, what a strange dog it was! "'Why, he was a big, rough, ugly-looking monster, 
with three separate heads, and each of them fiercer than the two others. But fierce as they were, King Pluto patted them all. He seemed as fond of his three-headed dog as if he had been a sweet little spaniel with silken ears and curly hair. Cerberus, on the other hand, was evidently rejoiced to see his master, and expressed his attachment, as other dogs do, by wagging his tail at great rate. Proserpina's eyes being drawn to it by its brisk motion, she saw that his tail was neither more nor less than a live dragon, with fiery eyes and fangs that had a very poisonous aspect. And while the three-headed Cerberus was fawning so lovingly on King Pluto, there was the dragon-tail wagging against its will, and looking as cross and ill-natured as you can imagine, on its own separate account. "'Will the dog bite me?' asked Proserpina, shrinking closer to Pluto. "'What an ugly creature he is!' "'Oh, never fear,' answered her companion. "'He never harms people unless they try to enter my dominions without being sent for, "'or to get away when I wish to keep them here. "'Down, Cerberus! "'Now, my pretty Proserpina, we will drive on.' "'On went the chariot, and King Pluto seemed greatly pleased "'to find himself once more in his own kingdom. "'He drew Proserpina's attention to the rich veins of gold "'that were to be seen among the rocks.' and pointed to several places where one stroke of a pickaxe would loosen a bushel of diamonds. All along the road, indeed, there were sparkling gems, which would have been of inestimable value above ground, but which were here reckoned of the meaner sort, and hardly worth a beggar's stooping for. Not far from the gateway they came to a bridge which seemed to be built of iron. Pluto stopped the chariot, and bade Proserpina, "'look at the stream which was gliding so lazily beneath it. "'Never in her life had she beheld so torpid, "'so black, so muddy-looking a stream. "'Its waters reflected no images of anything that was on the banks, "'and it moved as sluggishly as if it had quite forgotten "'which way it ought to flow, "'and had rather stagnate than flow either one way or the other. "'This is the river Lethe,' observed King Pluto. "'Is it not a very pleasant stream?' "'I think it a very dismal one,' said Proserpina. "'It suits my taste, however,' answered Pluto, "'who was apt to be sullen when anybody disagreed with him. "'At all events, its water has one very excellent quality, "'for a single draught of it makes people forget every care and sorrow "'that has hitherto tormented them. "'Only sip a little of it, my dear Proserpina, "'and you will instantly cease to grieve for your mother,' "'and will have nothing in your memory that can prevent you of being perfectly happy in my palace. "'I will send for some in a golden goblet the moment we arrive.' "'Oh, no, no, no!' cried Proserpina, weeping afresh. "'I had a thousand times rather be miserable with remembering my mother "'than be happy in forgetting her. "'That dear, dear mother, I never, never will forget her.' "'We shall see,' said King Pluto. "'You do not know what fine times we will have in my palace. "'Here we are just at the portal. "'These pillars are solid gold, I assure you.' "'He alighted from the chariot, and taking Proserpina in his arms, "'carried her up a lofty flight of steps into the great hall of the palace. "'It was splendidly illuminated by means of large precious stones of various hues, "'which seemed to burn like so many lamps.' "'and glowed with a hundredfold radiance all through the vast apartment. "'And yet there was a kind of gloom in the midst of this enchanted light, "'nor was there a single object in the hall that was really agreeable to behold, "'except the little Proserpina herself, a lovely child, "'with one earthly flower which she had not let fall from her hand. "'It is my opinion that even King Pluto had never been happy in his palace,' and that this was the true reason why he had stolen away Proserpina, in order that he might have something to love, instead of cheating his heart any longer with this tiresome magnificence. And though he pretended to dislike the sunshine of the upper world, yet the effect of the child's presence, bedimmed as she was by her tears, was as if a faint and watery sunbeam had somehow or other found its way into the enchanted hall. Pluto now summoned his domestics, and bade them lose no time in preparing a most sumptuous banquet, and above all things not to fail of setting a golden beaker of the water of Lethe by Proserpina's plate. "'I will neither drink that nor anything else,' said Proserpina, 
nor will I taste a morsel of food, even if you keep me for ever in your palace. I should be sorry for that, replied King Pluto, patting her cheek, for he really wished to be kind, if he had only known how. You are a spoiled child, I perceive, my little Proserpina, but when you see the nice things which my cook will make for you, your appetite will quickly come again. Then, sending for the head cook, he gave strict orders that all sorts of delicacies, such as young people are usually fond of, should be set before Proserpina. He had a secret motive in this, for, you are to understand, it is a fixed law that, when persons are carried off to the land of magic, if they once taste any food there, they can never get back to their friends. Now, if King Pluto had been cunning enough to offer Proserpina some fruit, or bread and milk, which was the simplest fare to which the child had always been accustomed, it is very probable that she would soon have been tempted to eat it. But he left the matter entirely to his cook, who, like all other cooks, considered nothing fit to eat unless it were rich pastry, or highly seasoned meat, or spiced sweet cakes, things which Proserpine's mother had never given her, and the smell of which quite took away her appetite, instead of sharpening it. But my story must now clamber out of King Pluto's dominions, and see what Mother Ceres has been about since she was bereft of her daughter. We had a glimpse of her, as you remember, half hidden among the waving grain, while the four black steeds were swiftly whirling along the chariot in which her beloved Proserpina was so unwillingly borne away. You recollect, too, the loud scream which Proserpina gave, just when the chariot was out of sight. Of all the child's outcries, this last shriek was the only one that reached the ears of Mother Ceres. She had mistaken the rumbling of the chariot wheels for a peal of thunder, and imagined that a shower was coming up, and that it would assist her in making the corn grow. But at the sound of Proserpina's shriek she started, and looked about in every direction, not knowing whence it came, but feeling almost certain that it was her daughter's voice. It seemed so unaccountable, however, that the girl should have strayed over so many lands and seas, which she herself could not have traversed without the aid of her winged dragons, that the good Ceres tried to believe that it must be the child of some other parent, and not her own darling Proserpina, who had uttered this lamentable cry. Nevertheless, it troubled her, with a vast many tender fears, such as are ready to bestir themselves in every mother's heart, when she finds it necessary to go away from her dear children, without leaving them under the care of some maiden aunt or other such faithful guardian. So she quickly left the field in which she had been so busy, and as her work was not half done, the grain looked next day as if it needed both sun and rain, and as if it were blighted in the ear and had something the matter with its roots. The pair of dragons must have had very nimble wings, for in less than an hour Mother Ceres had alighted at the door of her home and found it empty. Knowing, however, that the child was fond of sporting on the seashore, she hastened thither as fast as she could, and there beheld the wet faces of the poor sea-nymphs peeping over a wave. All this while the good creatures had been waiting on the bank of sponge, and once every half minute or so, had popped up their four heads above water, to see if their playmate were yet coming back. When they saw Mother Ceres, they sat down on the crest of the surf-wave, and let it toss them ashore at her feet. "'Where is Proserpina?' cried Ceres. "'Where is my child? Tell me, you naughty sea-nymphs, have you enticed her under the sea?' "'Oh, no, good Mother Ceres,' said the innocent sea-nymphs, tossing back their green ringlets, and looking her in the face." We never should dream of such a thing. Proserpina has been at play with us, it is true, but she left us a long while ago, meaning only to run a little way upon the dry land and gather some flowers for a wreath. This was early in the day, and we have seen nothing of her since. Ceres scarcely waited to hear what the nymphs had to say before she hurried off to make inquiries all through the neighbourhood. But nobody told her anything, that could enable the poor mother to guess what had become of Proserpina. A fisherman, it is true, had noticed her little footprints in the sand, as he went homeward along the beach with a basket of fish. A rustic had seen the child stooping to gather flowers. Several persons had heard either the rattling of chariot wheels, 
or the rumbling of distant thunder, and one old woman, while placking vervain and catnip, had heard a scream, but supposed it to be some childish nonsense, and therefore did not take the trouble to look up. The stupid people! It took them such a tedious while to tell the nothing that they knew, that it was dark night before Mother Ceres found out that she must seek her daughter elsewhere. So she lighted a torch and set forth, resolving never to come back until Proserpina was discovered. In her haste and trouble of mind, she quite forgot her car and the winged dragons, or, it may be, she thought that she could follow up the search more thoroughly on foot. At all events, this was the way in which she began her sorrowful journey, holding the torch before her, and looking carefully at every object along the path, and as it happened, she had not gone far before she found one of the magnificent flowers which grew on the shrub that Proserpina had pulled up. Ha! thought Mother Ceres, examining it by torchlight. Here is mischief in this flower. The earth did not produce it by any help of mine, nor of its own accord. It is the work of enchantment, and is therefore poisonous, and perhaps it has poisoned my poor child. But she put the poisonous flower in her bosom, not knowing whether she might ever find any other memorial of Proserpina. All night long, at the door of every cottage and farmhouse, Ceres knocked and called up the weary labourers to inquire if they had seen her child, and they stood gaping and half asleep at their threshold, and answered her pityingly, and besought her to come in and rest. At the portal of every palace, too, she made so loud a summons that the menials hurried to throw open the gate, thinking that it must be some great king or queen, who would demand a banquet for supper, and a stately chamber to repose in. And when they saw only a sad and anxious woman, with a torch in her hand and a wreath of withered poppies on her head, they spoke rudely, and sometimes threatened to set the dogs upon her. But nobody had seen Proserpina, nor could give Mother Ceres the least hint which waged to seek her. Thus passed the night, and still she continued her search without sitting down to rest, or stopping to take food, or even remembering to put out the torch. Although first the rosy dawn, and then the glad light of the morning sun, made its red flame look thin and pale. But I wonder what sort of stuff this torch was made of, for it burned dimly through the day, and at night was as bright as ever, and never was extinguished by the rain or wind in all the weary days and nights while Ceres was seeking for Proserpina. It was not merely of human beings that she asked tidings of her daughter. In the woods and by the stream she met creatures of another nature, who used in those old times to haunt the pleasant and solitary places, and were very sociable with persons who understood their language and customs, as Mother Ceres did. Sometimes, for instance, she tapped with her finger against the knotted trunk of a majestic oak, and immediately its rude bark would cleave asunder, and forth would step a beautiful maiden, who was the hamadryad of the oak, dwelling inside it, and sharing its long life, and rejoicing when its green leaves sported with the breeze. But not one of these leafy damsels had seen Proserpina. Then, going a little further, Ceres would, perhaps, come to a fountain gushing out of a pebbly hollow in the earth, and would dabble with her hand in the water. Behold, up through its sandy and pebbly bed, along with the fountain's gush, a young woman with dripping hair would arise, and stand gazing at Mother Ceres half out of the water, and undulating up and down with its ever-restless motion. But when the mother asked whether the poor lost child had stopped to drink out of the fountain, the naiad, with weeping eyes, for these water-nymphs had tears to spare for everybody's grief, would answer, No, in a murmuring voice, which was just like the murmur of the stream. Often, likewise, she encountered fawns, who looked like sunburnt country people, except that they had hairy ears, and little horns upon their foreheads, and the hinder legs of goats, on which they gambled merrily about the woods and fields. They were a frolicsome kind of creature, but grew as sad as their cheerful dispositions would allow when Ceres inquired for her daughter, and they had no good news to tell. But sometimes she came suddenly upon a rude gang of satyrs, who had faces like monkeys and horses' tails behind them, and who were generally dancing in a very boisterous manner, with shouts of noisy laughter. 
When she stopped to question them, they would only laugh the louder and make new merriment out of the lone woman's distress. How unkind of those ugly satyrs! And once, while crossing a solitary sheep pasture, she saw a personage named Pan, seated at the foot of the tall rock and making music on a shepherd's flute. He, too, had horns and hairy ears and goat's feet, but, being acquainted with Mother Ceres, he answered her question as civilly as he knew how, and invited her to taste some milk and honey out of a wooden bowl. But neither could Pan tell her what had become of Proserpina, any better than the rest of these wild people. And thus Mother Ceres went wandering about for nine long days and nights, finding no trace of Proserpina, unless it were now and then a withered flower, and these she picked up and put in her bosom, because she fancied that they might have fallen from her poor child's hand. All day she travelled onward through the hot sun, and at night again the flame of the torch would redden and gleam along the pathway, and she continued her search by its light without ever sitting down to rest. On the tenth day she chanced to espy the mouth of a cavern, within which, though it was bright noon everywhere else, there would have been only a dusky twilight, but it so happened that a torch was burning there, it flickered and struggled with the duskiness, but could not half light up the gloomy cavern with all its melancholy glimmer. Ceres was resolved to leave no spot without a search, so she peeped into the entrance of the cave and lighted it up a little more by holding her own torch before her. In so doing, she caught a glimpse of what seemed to be a woman sitting on the brown leaves of the last autumn, a great heap of which had been swept into the cave by the wind. This woman, if woman it were, was by no means so beautiful as many of her sex, for her head, they tell me, was shaped very much like a dog's, and, by way of ornament, she wore a wreath of snakes around it. But Mother Ceres, the moment she saw her, knew that this was an odd kind of person, who put all her enjoyment in being miserable, and never would have a word to say to other people, unless they were as melancholy and wretched as she herself delighted to be. I am wretched enough now, thought poor Ceres, to talk with this melancholy Hecate, were she ten times sadder than ever she was yet. So she stepped into the cave and sat down on the withered leaves by the dog-headed woman's side. In all the world, since her daughter's loss, she had found no other companion. Oh, Hecate, she said, if ever you lose a daughter, you will know what sorrow is. Tell me, for pity's sake, have you seen my poor child Proserpina pass by the mouth of your cavern? No, answered Hecate, in a cracked voice and sighing betwixt every word or two. No, Mother Ceres, I have seen nothing of your daughter, but my ears, you must know, are made in such a way that all cries of distress and affright all over the world are pretty sure to find their way to them. And nine days ago, as I sat in my cave, making myself very miserable, I heard the voice of a young girl shrieking as if in great distress. Something terrible has happened to the child, you may rest assured. As well as I could judge, a dragon, or some other cruel monster, was carrying her away. You kill me by saying so, cried Ceres, almost ready to faint. Where was the sound, and which way did it seem to go? It passed very swiftly along, said Hecate, and at the same time there was a heavy rumbling of wheels towards the eastward. I can tell you nothing more, except that, in my honest opinion, you will never see your daughter again. The best advice I can give you is to take up your abode in this cavern, where we will be the two most wretched women in the world. Not yet, dark Hecate, replied Ceres. But do you first come with your torch and help me to seek for my lost child? And when there shall be no more hope of finding her, if that black day is ordained to come, then, if you will give me room to fling myself down, either on these withered leaves or on the naked rock, I will show you what it is to be miserable. But until I know that she has perished from the face of the earth, I will not allow myself space even to grieve." The dismal Hecate did not much like the idea of going abroad into the sunny world, but then she reflected that the sorrow of the disconsolate Ceres would be like a gloomy twilight round about them both, let the sun shine ever so brightly, and that therefore she might enjoy her bad spirits quite as well as if she were to stay in the cave. So she finally consented to go, and they set out together, both carrying torches, although it was broad daylight and clear sunshine. 
The torchlight seemed to make a gloom, so that the people whom they met along the road could not very distinctly see their figures, and indeed if they once caught a glimpse of Hecate, with the wreath of snakes around her forehead, they generally thought it prudent to run away without waiting for a second glance. As the pair travelled along in this woe-begone manner, a thought struck Ceres. "'There is one person,' she exclaimed, "'who must have seen my poor child, and can doubtless tell what has become of her. "'Why did I not think of him before? It is Phoebus.' What said Hecate, the young man that always sits in the sunshine, oh pray do not think of going near him. He is a gay, light, frivolous young fellow, and will only smile in your face, and besides there is such a glare of the sun about him that he will quite blind my poor eyes, which I have almost wept away already. You have promised to be my companion, answered Ceres. Come, let us make haste, or the sunshine will be gone and Phoebus along with it. Accordingly they went along in quest of Phoebus, both of them sighing grievously, and Hecate, to say the truth, making a great deal worse lamentation than Ceres, for all the pleasure she had, you know, lay in being miserable, and therefore she made the most of it. By and by, after a pretty long journey, they arrived at the sunniest spot in the whole world. There they beheld a beautiful young man with long, curling ringlets, which seemed to be made of golden sunbeams. His garments were like light summer clouds, and the expression of his face was so exceedingly vivid that Hecate held her hands before her eyes, muttering that he ought to wear a black veil. Phoebus, for this was the very person whom they were seeking, had a lyre in his hands, and was making its chords tremble with sweet music, at the same time singing a most exquisite song which he had recently composed, for, besides a great many other accomplishments, this young man was renowned for his admirable poetry. As Ceres and her dismal companion approached him, Phoebus smiled on them so cheerfully that Hecate's wreath of snakes gave a spiteful hiss, and Hecate heartily wished herself back in her cave. But as for Ceres, she was too earnest in her grief either to know or care whether Phoebus smiled or frowned. Phoebus, exclaimed she, I am in great trouble and have come to you for assistance. Can you tell me what has become of my dear child Proserpina? Proserpina? Proserpina, did you call her name? answered Phoebus, endeavouring to recollect, for there was such a continual flow of pleasant ideas in his mind that he was apt to forget what had happened no longer ago than yesterday. Ah, oh, yes, I remember her now, a very lovely child indeed. I am happy to tell you, my dear madam, that I did see the little Proserpina not many days ago. You may make yourself perfectly easy about her. She is safe and in excellent hands. Oh, where is my dear child? cried Ceres, clasping her hands and flinging herself at his feet. Why, said Phoebus, and as he spoke, he kept touching his lyre so as to make a thread of music run in and out among his words. As the little damsel was gathering flowers, and she really has a very exquisite taste for flowers, she was suddenly snatched up by King Pluto and carried off to his dominions. I have never been in that part of the universe, but the royal palace, I am told, is built in a very noble style of architecture, and of the most splendid and costly materials. Gold, diamonds, pearls, and all manner of precious stones will be your daughter's ordinary playthings. I recommend to you, my dear lady, to give yourself no uneasiness, Proserpina's sense of beauty will be duly gratified, and, even in spite of the lack of sunshine, she will lead a very enviable life. Hush! Say not a word, answered Ceres indignantly. What is there to gratify her heart? What are all the splendours you speak of without affection? I must have her back again. Will you go with me, Phoebus, to demand my daughter of this wicked Pluto? Pray excuse me, replied Phoebus, with an elegant obeisance. I certainly wish you success, and regret that my own affairs are so immediately pressing that I cannot have the pleasure of attending you. Besides, I am not upon the best of terms with King Pluto. To tell you the truth, his three-headed mastiff would never let me pass the gateway, for I should be compelled to take a sheaf of sunbeams along with me, and those, you know, are forbidden things in Pluto's kingdom. Ah, Phoebus! said Ceres, with bitter meaning in her words. You have a harp instead of a heart. Farewell. 
"'Will you not stay a moment?' asked Phoebus, "'to hear me turn the pretty and touching story "'of Proserpina into extemporary verse.' "'But Ceres shook her head, "'and hastened away along with Hecate. "'Phoebus, who, as I have told you, "'was an exquisite poet, "'forthwith began to make an ode "'about the poor mother's grief, "'and if we were to judge of his sensibility "'by this beautiful production, "'he must have been endowed with a very tender heart.' But when a poet gets into the habit of using his heartstrings to make chords for his lyre, he may thrum upon them as much as he will, without any great pain to himself. Accordingly, though Phoebus sang a very sad song, he was as merry all the while as were the sunbeams amid which he dwelt. Poor Mother Ceres had now found out what had become of her daughter, but was not a whit happier than before. Her case, on the contrary, looked more desperate than ever. As long as Proserpina was above ground, there might have been hopes of regaining her. But now that the poor child was shut up within the iron gates of the King of the Mines, at the threshold of which lay the three-headed Cerberus, there seemed no possibility of her ever making her escape. The dismal Hecate, who loved to take the darkest view of things, told Ceres that she had better come with her to the cavern, and spend the rest of her life in being miserable. Ceres answered that Hecate was welcome to go back thither herself, but that, for her part, she would wander about the earth in quest of the entrance to King Pluto's dominions. And Hecate took her at her word, and hurried back to her beloved cave, frightening a great many little children with a glimpse of her dog's face as she went. Poor mother Ceres, it is melancholy to think of her pursuing her toilsome way all alone, and holding up that never-dying torch, the flame of which seemed an emblem of the grief and hope that burned together in her heart. So much did she suffer that, though her aspect had been quite youthful when her troubles began, she grew to look like an elderly person in a very brief time. She cared not how she was dressed, nor had she ever thought of flinging away the wreath of withered poppies, which she put on the very morning of Proserpina's disappearance. She roamed about in so wild a way, and with her hair so dishevelled, that people took her for some distracted creature, and never dreamed that it was Mother Ceres who had the oversight of every seed which the husbandman planted. Nowadays, however, she gave herself no trouble about seed-time, nor harvest, but left the farmers to take care of their own affairs, and the crops to fade or flourish, as the case might be. There was nothing now in which Ceres seemed to feel an interest, unless when she saw children at play or gathering flowers along the wayside. Then, indeed, she would stand and gaze at them with tears in her eyes. The children, too, appeared to have a sympathy with her grief, and would cluster themselves in a little group about her knees, and look up wistfully in her face, and Ceres, after giving them a kiss all round, would lead them to their homes and advise their mothers never to let them stray out of sight. "'For if they do,' said she, "'it may happen to you, as it happened to me, "'that the iron-hearted King Pluto will take a liking to your darlings "'and snatch them up in his chariot and carry them away.' "'One day, during her pilgrimage in quest of the entrance to Pluto's kingdom, "'she came to the palace of King Celius, who reigned at Eleusis. "'Ascending a lofty flight of steps, she entered the portal "'and found the royal household in very great alarm about the Queen's baby.' The infant, it seems, was sickly, being troubled with its teeth, I suppose, and would take no food, and was all the time moaning with pain. The queen, her name was Metanira, was desirous of finding a nurse, and when she beheld a woman of matronly aspect coming up the palace steps, she thought in her own mind that here was the very person whom she needed. So Queen Metanira ran to the door, with the poor wailing baby in her arms, and besought Ceres to take charge of it, at least to tell her what would do it good. "'Will you trust the child entirely to me?' asked Ceres. "'Yes, and gladly too,' answered the Queen, "'if you will devote all your time to him, for I can see that you have been a mother.' "'You are right,' said Ceres. "'I once had a child of my own. "'Well, I will be the nurse of this poor sickly boy, "'but beware, I warn you, that you do not interfere.' "'with any kind of treatment which I may judge proper for him. "'If you do so, the poor infant must suffer for his mother's folly.' "'Then she kissed the child, and it seemed to do him good, "'for he smiled and nestled closely into her bosom. 
So Mother Ceres set her torch in a corner, where it kept burning all the while, and took up her abode in the palace of King Celius, as nurse to the little prince de Mophoon. She treated him as if he were her own child, and allowed neither the king nor the queen to say whether he should be bathed in warm or cold water, or what he should eat, or how often he should take the air, or when he should be put to bed. You would hardly believe me if I were to tell how quickly the baby prince got rid of his ailments, and grew fat and rosy and strong, and how he had two rows of ivory teeth in less time than any other little fellow, before or since. Instead of the palest and wretchedest and puniest imp in the world, as his own mother confessed him to be when Ceres first took him in charge, he was now a strapping baby, crowing, laughing, kicking up his heels, and rolling from one end of the room to the other. All the good women of the neighbourhood crowded to the palace, and held up their hands in unutterable amazement at the beauty and wholesomeness of this darling little prince. Their wonder was the greater, because he was never seen to taste any food, not even so much as a cup of milk. Pray, nurse, the queen kept saying, how is it that you make the child thrive so? I was a mother once, Ceres always replied, and having nursed my own child, I know what other children need. But Queen Metanira, as was very natural, had a great curiosity to know precisely what the nurse did to her child. One night, therefore, she hid herself in the chamber where Ceres and the little prince were accustomed to sleep. There was a fire in the chimney, and it had now crumbled into great coals and embers, which lay glowing on the hearth, with a blaze flickering up now and then, and flinging a warm and ruddy light upon the walls. Ceres sat before the hearth with the child in her lap, and the firelight making her shadow dance upon the ceiling overhead. She undressed the little prince and bathed him all over with some fragrant liquid out of a vase. The next thing she did was to rake back the red embers and make a hollow place among them, just where the backlog had been. At last, when the baby was crowing and clapping his fat little hands and laughing in the nurse's face, just as you may have seen your little brother or sister do before going into its warm bath, Ceres suddenly laid him, all naked as he was, in the hollow among the red-hot embers. She then raked the ashes over him and turned quietly away. You may imagine, if you can, how Queen Metanira shrieked, thinking nothing less than that her dear child would be burned to a cinder. She burst forth from her hiding-place, and running to the hearth, raked open the fire and snatched up poor little Prince de Mofoam out of his bed of live coals, one of which he was gripping in each of his fists. He immediately set up a grievous cry, as babies are apt to do when rudely startled out of a sound sleep. To the queen's astonishment and joy, she could perceive no token of the child's being injured by the hot fire in which he had lain. She now turned to Mother Ceres and asked her to explain the mystery. "'Foolish woman,' answered Ceres, "'did you not promise to entrust this poor infant entirely to me? "'You little know the mischief you have done him.' Had you left him to my care, he would have grown up like a child of celestial birth, endowed with human strength and intelligence, and would have lived for ever. Do you imagine that earthly children are to become immortal without being tempered to it in the fiercest heat of the fire? But you have ruined your own son, for though he will be a strong man and a hero in his day, yet on account of your folly he will grow old and finally die like the sons of other women. The weak tenderness of his mother has cost the poor baby an immortality. Farewell. Saying these words, she kissed the little prince de Mofoam, and sighed to think what he had lost, and took her departure without heeding Queen Metanira, who entreated her to remain and cover up the child among the hot embers as often as she pleased. Poor baby, he never slept so warmly again. While she dwelt in the king's palace, Mother Ceres had been so continually occupied with taking care of the young prince that her heart was a little lightened of its grief for Proserpina. But now, having nothing else to busy herself about, she became just as wretched as before. At length, in her despair, she came to the dreadful resolution that not a stalk of grain, nor a blade of grass, not a potato, nor a turnip, nor any other vegetable that was good for man or beast to eat, should be suffered to grow until her daughter was restored. 
She even forbade the flowers to bloom, lest somebody's heart should be cheered by their beauty. Now as not so much as a head of asparagus ever presumed to poke itself out of the ground without the especial permission of Ceres, you may conceive what a terrible calamity had here befallen upon the earth. The husbandmen ploughed and planted as usual, but there lay the rich black furrows, all as barren as a desert of sand. The pastures looked as brown in the sweet month of June as ever they did in chill November. The rich man's broad acres and the cottager's small garden patch were equally blighted. Every little girl's flower bed showed nothing but dry stalks. The old people shook their white heads and said that the earth had grown aged like themselves and was no longer capable of wearing the warm smile of summer on its face. It was really piteous to see the poor, starving cattle and sheep, how they followed behind Ceres, lowing and bleating, as if their instinct taught them to expect help from her. And everybody that was acquainted with her power besought her to have mercy on the human race, and, at all events, to let the grass grow. But Mother Ceres, though naturally of an affectionate disposition, was now inexorable. Never, said she, if the earth is ever again to see any verdure, it must first grow along the path which my daughter will tread in coming back to me. Finally, as there seemed to be no other remedy, our old friend Quicksilver was sent post-haste to King Pluto, in hopes that he might be persuaded to undo the mischief he had done, and to set everything right again by giving up Proserpina. Quicksilver accordingly made the best of his way to the great gate, took a flying leap right over the three-headed mastiff, and stood at the door of the palace in an inconceivably short time. The servants knew him both by his face and garb, for his short cloak and his winged cap and shoes, and his snaky staff had often been seen thereabouts in times gone by. He requested to be shown immediately into the king's presence, and Pluto, who heard his voice from the top of the stairs, and who loved to recreate himself with Quicksilver's merry talk, called out to him to come up, and while they settled their business together, we must inquire what Proserpina has been doing ever since we saw her last. The child had declared, as you may remember, that she would not taste a mouthful of food as long as she should be compelled to remain in King Pluto's palace. How she contrived to maintain her resolution, and at the same time to keep herself tolerably plump and rosy, is more than I can explain. But some young ladies, I am given to understand, possess the faculty of living on air, and Proserpina seems to have possessed it too. At any rate, it was now six months since she left the outside of the earth, and not a morsel, so far as the attendants were able to testify, had yet passed between her teeth. This was the more creditable to Proserpina, inasmuch as King Pluto had caused her to be tempted day by day with all manner of sweetmeats and richly preserved fruits and delicacies of every sort, such as young people are generally most fond of. But her good mother had often told her of the hurtfulness of these things, and for that reason alone, if there had been no other, she would have resolutely refused to taste them. All this time, being of a cheerful and active disposition, the little damsel was not quite so unhappy as you may have supposed. The immense palace had a thousand rooms, and was full of beautiful and wonderful objects. There was a never-ceasing gloom, it is true, which half hid itself among the innumerable pillars, gliding before the child as she wandered among them, and treading stealthily behind her in the echo of her footsteps. Neither was all the dazzle of the precious stones which flamed with their own light worth one gleam of natural sunshine, nor could the most brilliant of the many-coloured gems which Proserpina had for playthings vie with the simple beauty of the flowers she used to gather. But still, wherever the girl went, among those gilded halls and chambers, it seemed as if she carried nature and sunshine along with her, and if she scattered dewy blossoms on her right hand and on her left... After Proserpina came, the palace was no longer the same abode of stately artifice and dismal magnificence that it had been before. The inhabitants all felt this, and King Pluto more than any of them. "'My own little Proserpina,' he used to say, "'I wish you could like me a little better. We gloomy and cloudy-natured persons have often as warm hearts at bottom as those of a more cheerful character.' 
If you would only stay with me of your own accord, it would make me happier than the possession of a hundred such palaces as this. Ah, said Proserpina, you should have tried to make me like you before carrying me off, and the best thing you can do now is to let me go again. Then I might remember you sometimes, and think that you were as kind as you knew how to be. Perhaps, too, one day or other, I might come back and pay you a visit. No, no, answered Pluto, with his gloomy smile. I will not trust you for that. You are too fond of living in the broad daylight and gathering flowers. What an idle and childish taste that is. Are not these gems, which I have ordered to be dug for you, and which are richer than any in my crown, are they not prettier than a violet? Not half so pretty, said Proserpina, snatching the gems from Pluto's hand and flinging them to the other end of the hall. Oh, my sweet violet, shall I never see you again? And then she burst into tears. But young people's tears have very little saltness or acidity in them, and do not inflame the eyes so much as those of grown persons, so that it is not to be wondered at if, a few minutes afterward, Proserpina was sporting through the hall almost as merrily as she and the four sea nymphs had sported along the edge of the surf wave. King Pluto gazed after her, and wished that he too was a child. And little Proserpina, when she turned about and beheld this great king standing in his splendid hall, and looking so grand and so melancholy and so lonesome, was smitten with a kind of pity. She ran back to him, and, for the first time in all her life, put her small, soft hand in his. "'I love you a little,' whispered she, looking up in his face. "'Do you indeed, my dear child?' cried Pluto, bending his dark face down to kiss her. But Proserpina shrank away from the kiss, for, though his features were noble, they were very dusky and grim. "'Well, I have not deserved it of you, after keeping you a prisoner for so many months, and starving you besides.' "'Are you not terribly hungry? "'Is there nothing which I can get you to eat?' "'In asking this question, the king of the mines had a very cunning purpose. "'For, you will recollect, if Proserpina tasted a morsel of food in his dominions, "'she would never afterward be at liberty to quit them.' "'No, indeed,' said Proserpina. "'Your head cook is always baking and stewing and roasting and rolling out paste "'and contriving one dish or another, which he imagines may be to my liking.' "'but he might just as well save himself the trouble, "'poor fat little man that he is. "'I have no appetite for anything in the world "'unless it were a slice of bread of my mother's own baking "'or a little fruit out of her garden.' "'When Pluto heard this, "'he began to see that he had mistaken the best method "'of tempting Proserpina to eat. "'The cook's made dishes and artificial dainties "'were not half so delicious in the good child's opinion "'as the simple fare to which Mother Ceres had accustomed her. Wondering that he had never thought of it before, the king now sent one of his trusty attendants with a large basket to get some of the finest and juiciest pears, peaches, and plums which could anywhere be found in the upper world. Unfortunately, however, this was during the time when Ceres had forbidden any fruits or vegetables to grow, and, after seeking all over the earth, King Pluto's servant found only a single pomegranate, and that so dried up as to be not worth eating. Nevertheless, since there was no better to be had, he brought this dry, old, withered pomegranate home to the palace, put it on a magnificent golden salver, and carried it up to Proserpina. Now it happened, curiously enough, that just as the servant was bringing the pomegranate into the back door of the palace, our friend Quicksilver had gone up the front steps on his errand to get Proserpina away from King Pluto. As soon as Proserpina saw the pomegranate on the golden salver, she told the servant he had better take it away again. "'I shall not touch it, I assure you,' said she. "'If I were ever so hungry, I should never think of eating such a miserable dry pomegranate as that.' "'It is the only one in the world,' said the servant. He set down the golden salver, with the wizened pomegranate upon it, and left the room. When he was gone, Proserpina could not help coming close to the table— and looking at this poor specimen of dried fruit with a great deal of eagerness, for, to say the truth, on seeing something that suited her taste, she felt all the six months' appetite taking possession of her at once. To be sure, it was a very wretched-looking pomegranate, and seemed to have no more juice in it than an oyster-shell, 
but there was no choice of such things in King Pluto's palace. This was the first fruit she had seen there, and the last she was ever likely to see, and unless she ate it up immediately, it would grow drier than it already was, and be wholly unfit to eat. At least I may smell it, thought Proserpina. So she took up the pomegranate and applied it to her nose, and, somehow or other, being in such close neighbourhood to her mouth, the fruit found its way into that little red cave. Dear me, what an everlasting pity! Before Proserpina knew what she was about, her teeth had actually bitten it of their own accord. Just as this fatal deed was done, the door of the apartment opened, and in came King Pluto, followed by Quicksilver, who had been urging him to let his little prisoner go. At the first noise of their entrance, Proserpina withdrew the pomegranate from her mouth, but Quicksilver, whose eyes were very keen and his wits the sharpest that ever anybody had, perceived that the child was a little confused, and seeing the empty salver, he suspected that she had been taking a sly nibble of something or other. As for honest Pluto, he never guessed at the secret. "'My little Proserpina,' said the king, sitting down, and affectionately drawing her between his knees, "'here is Quicksilver, who tells me that a great many misfortunes have befallen innocent people, on account of my detaining you in my dominions. To confess the truth, I myself had already reflected that it was an unjustifiable act to take you away from your good mother.' "'But then you must consider, my dear child, that this vast palace is apt to be gloomy, "'although the precious stones certainly shine very bright, "'and that I am not of the most cheerful disposition, "'and that therefore it was a natural thing enough "'to seek for the society of some merrier creature than myself. "'I hoped you would take my crown for a plaything, "'and me, ah, you laugh, naughty Proserpina, "'me, grim as I am, for a playmate. "'It was a silly expectation.' "'Not so extremely silly,' whispered Proserpina. "'You have really amused me very much sometimes.' "'Thank you,' said King Pluto, rather dryly. "'But I can see, plainly enough, "'that you think my palace a dusky prison, "'and me the iron-hearted keeper of it. "'And an iron heart I should surely have "'if I could detain you here any longer, my poor child, "'when it is now six months since you tasted food. "'I give you your liberty.' Go with Quicksilver. Hasten home to your dear mother. Now, although you may not have supposed it, Proserpina found it impossible to take leave of poor King Pluto without some regrets, and a good deal of compunction for not telling him about the pomegranate. She even shed a tear or two, thinking how lonely and cheerless the great palace would seem to him with all its ugly glare of artificial light, after she herself, his one little ray of natural sunshine, whom he had stolen, to be sure, but only because he valued her so much, after she should have departed. I know not how many kind things she might have said to the disconsolate king of the mines, had not Quicksilver hurried her away. "'Come along quickly,' whispered he in her ear, "'or his majesty may change his royal mind, and take care, above all things, that you say nothing of what was brought you on the golden salver.' In a very short time they had passed the great gateway, leaving the three-headed Cerberus barking and yelping and growling with threefold din behind them, and emerged upon the surface of the earth. It was delightful to behold, as Proserpina hastened along, how the path grew verdant behind and on either side of her. Wherever she set her blessed foot, there was at once a dewy flower. The violets gushed up along the wayside, the grass and the grain began to sprout with tenfold vigour and luxuriance, to make up for the dreary months that had been wasted in barrenness. The starved cattle immediately set to work grazing, after their long fast, and ate enormously all day, and got up at midnight to eat more. But I can assure you, it was a busy time of year with the farmers, when they found the summer coming upon them with such a rush. Nor must I forget to say that all the birds in the whole world hopped upon the newly blossoming trees, and sang together in a prodigious ecstasy of joy. Mother Ceres had returned to her deserted home, and was sitting disconsolately on the doorstep, with her torch burning in her hand. She had been idly watching the flame for some moments past, when all at once it flickered and went out. "'What does this mean?' thought she. "'It was an enchanted torch, and should have kept burning till my child came back.' 
Lifting her eyes, she was surprised to see a sudden verdure flashing over the brown and barren fields, exactly as you may have observed a golden hue gleaming far and wide across the landscape from the just-risen sun. "'Does the earth disobey me?' exclaimed Mother Ceres indignantly. "'Does it presume to be green when I have bidden it be barren, until my daughter shall be restored to my arms?' "'Then open your arms, dear mother,' cried a well-known voice, "'and take your little daughter into them.' "'And Proserpina came running, "'and flung herself upon her mother's bosom. "'Their mutual transport is not to be described. "'The grief of their separation "'had caused both of them to shed a great many tears, "'and now they shed a great many more, "'because their joy could not so well express itself "'in any other way. "'When their hearts had grown a little more quiet, "'Mother Ceres looked anxiously at Proserpina.' "'My child,' said she, "'did you taste any food while you were in King Pluto's palace?' "'Dearest mother,' answered Proserpina, "'I will tell you the whole truth. "'Until this very morning not a morsel of food has passed my lips. "'But today they brought me a pomegranate, "'a very dry one it was, and all shriveled up, "'till there was little left of it but seeds and skin. "'And having seen no fruit for so long a time, "'and being faint with hunger, "'I was tempted just to bite it.' The instant I tasted it, King Pluto and Quicksilver came into the room. I had not swallowed a morsel, but, dear mother, I hope it was no harm, but six of the pomegranate seeds, I am afraid, remained in my mouth. "'Ah, unfortunate child, and miserable me!' exclaimed Ceres. "'For each of those six pomegranate seeds, you must spend one month of every year in King Pluto's palace. You are but half restored to your mother.' "'only six months with me, and six with that good-for-nothing king of darkness.' "'Do not speak so harshly of poor King Pluto,' said Proserpina, kissing her mother. "'He has some very good qualities, and I really think I can bear to spend six months in his palace, "'if he will only let me spend the other six with you. "'He certainly did very wrong to carry me off, but then, as he says, it was but a dismal sort of life for him, "'to live in that great gloomy place all alone.' and it has made a wonderful change in his spirits to have a little girl to run upstairs and down. There is some comfort in making him so happy, and so, upon the whole, dearest mother, let us be thankful that he is not to keep me the whole year round. End of section 5